My name is Gareth Knight. Uh, I am a technologist essentially. Um, I was educated as a zoologist, but I kind of got to tech the round way. Um, my passions are innovating and building stuff that people love to use. Gareth, you have recently been voted GQ's digital maven. How does it feel to be such an iconic figure? Pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah, it, you know, you, you grow up kind of idolizing people. And then one day you see that you're in a magazine alongside the Springbok, uh, Springbok rugby captain and the Springbok or the Protea, the, the cricket captain, and a couple of other well-known people. How did you acquire such an entrepreneurial spirit? My grandfather was an entrepreneur, my uncle was, uh, my dad was or is. Um, so I think it runs in the family. But also there's, for me, a deep sense of having control of my destiny. I, I find it... Um, difficult to accept that I should work in a big company and that they should tell me what I should do every day and how I should go about that. Um, so it's kind of getting up in the morning and loving what I do as opposed to getting up in the morning and doing something that I have to do. And that's really what it is. It's just really kind of keeping in, in touch with what makes me happy. And what makes me happy is building stuff. So that's what I do. What do you believe is fundamental to a successful business? Don't do business with friends <laughs> unless you have a really, really strong friendship that can uh, be uh, that can work under a lot of pressure. I think that's probably the right way to explain it. Um, and where you've got some kind of legal arrangement before you start the business together. Um, I think that if you're going to build a business, you have to have a very clear direction for where you're going. Um, I also don't believe in balance per se. People talk about a work-life balance. I don't think that there's such a thing as a work-life balance all the time. I think sometimes you have to work harder and sometimes you have to work less hard but it's never always the same. And if it is, then something's wrong. Um, I think another big lesson is people. So in any business that I'm a part of, I wanna work with good people. I wanna work with fun people. I wanna have fun because work is about, well, work is what, 60% of your life, 70% of your life. So you should have fun while you're doing it. Um, and so people are very, very important. Um, the other thing is, is that when you're hiring people, I found that if you hire for aptitude and attitude, it's preferable and better than hiring for skill because skill can be taught but someone's attitude and someone's aptitude can't be taught so if someone's a hard worker they're naturally a hard worker it doesn't matter how skillful they are if they're not a hard worker they're not going to work hard so those are kind of the big lessons for me the other thing is is that money is everywhere people have this perception that there is no money and that it's hard to find money i think that's the wrong approach the approach should be how do i build something which money wants to fund if that makes sense so it's not about there being money. There is money. There's loads of money. It's just having the right angle for that money. Um, and I think, yeah, that's another big lesson. But doesn't access, you know, having access to those people who have money, mm -hmm. doesn't that play a part as well? Massively, yes. But to get that access, you need to prove yourself. And so it's not about finding the people. It's about proving that you're worthwhile as an investment for those people. Does that make sense? So like what I'm finding is, is that with the investors that I know, they do more work with people, uh, sorry, they, they do work with more people second time, third time, than they would with say first time people. And I think the reason is because once you're a trusted person and people know that you are hardworking and that you're trustworthy with their money, then it's much easier for them to make a decision to invest with you than it is with a stranger who they don't know. So I, I think for anybody watching this, the key is, is to being is to figure out how you can become trustworthy and how you can show that you can be a valuable part of an investment, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then to keep building that network. Tell us about Tech for Africa. One of the things that I've realized is that in South Africa, because it's such a small market, um, there isn't a lot of global perspective. And what frustrates me is that people in South Africa could be building applications for the iTunes store, right? They could be building applications like Kindo. And in fact, we were given the opportunity while building Kindo to take it back to South Africa and build it from there. But we chose not to. And in hindsight, that might have been a mistake because we would have spent less money. Um, so the, the general premise is that they're very smart people in South Africa and they could be doing global stuff. And they could also be doing really good stuff in Africa. But they seem to be very narrow or myopic in the way they view the world and, and, and what they have to offer. And so Tech for Africa is about trying to create more perspective and to say, here are these awesome people from around the world who have done really cool stuff, learn from them and then apply those learnings into Africa and into global products. And that's really it. It's just, you know, it's, it's about giving access to really, really good people and then hoping that that access will foster growth and development and new products and new services in the African market. 
So I think the tagline is, is almost, well, it's not a tagline, but the way to think of it is like um, taking global knowledge and applying it locally. I've got three uh, lessons that I've picked up over the last year and a half or so of trying to move back to South Africa. The first one is that there's a hell of a lot of opportunity in South Africa. Anybody who lives in London who doesn't think that there's opportunity, I think, might be a bit naive or might have the wrong information. Um, what I've learned is that the market in South Africa is, is not the same as it is in the UK at all. So a couple of points on that. Firstly, the number of services that you find in the UK you just don't have in South Africa. Um, so that leads on to the amount of diversity in business. So the number of types of businesses in the UK are not the same as the number of types of businesses in South Africa. So the flip side of that is because of all of that, there's a hell of a lot less competition. So if you're good at what you do in South Africa, you can be very competitive. In the UK, it's a lot harder because there's a lot more people that are good. So it's a lot harder to be competitive. In South Africa, you can be a lot more competitive. The other thing that I've realized is that there's a massive skills gap. Um, there, there seems to be a lot of people that are entering the job market who don't have a lot of skill. And then there's a, quite a lot of people at the top end of the job market who have a lot of skill. But in between, there's not much. I'm 32, so that places me kind of near maybe the, the, the middle-ish. Uh, I'm not kind of 50-year-old person with you know, 20 years of experience. But what that means is that all the experience that I have, I can take back to South Africa and I can apply it there. How do you see the brain drain reversing in South Africa? I'm definitely seeing a, a large amount of people in my own group of friends going back. So, you know, in London of my original maybe 15, 20 people that, that we were good, you know, tight friends maybe five, six years ago, there's two of us left. Everyone's gone back to South Africa and they're all professionals who want to go back, want to raise a family, want to buy a house, want to live a good lifestyle. I think if you're going to make a life move back, you should do the preparation necessary to make it a success. So you've recently shifted uh, your focus to setting up a company in South Africa, is that correct? Yeah. Um, what were the main reasons for that? Well, when I did the maths, um, the same number of people for the same kind of skill were going to cost me uh, two to four times more than they would have costed in South Africa. If you're going to go back to make money, then you need to find your way into a money business, right? That, that, that makes sense. But a lot of people go back for the lifestyle. So for me, you have to kind of reconcile the lifestyle versus the money part of things and figure out where you're going to sit. You can build something that has a global audience in South Africa and you can grow it that way. So like one of the things that we learned how to do was to localize. So we built an application and we scaled it to 17 languages. So what is your advice for anyone who wants to start a business? The thing that I keep going back to is, is value. So where do you create value in the relationship with your, the people who you're going to be a supplier to or that you're going to create a product for or that you're going to offer a service to? What is the value proposition? A lot of people that I see who are first-time entrepreneurs, or maybe even second or third-time entrepreneurs, they don't understand how to articulate what their value is. So someone will say, I'm an accountant. But that doesn't tell me anything about the value that you offer. If you say to me, I'm an accountant that can save you 30,000 Rand a year, then I want to listen. Yeah.